progress. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you again for to DL City staff and especially the IT staff today for making this meeting happen. And Esther and uh, CFEC staff. It's it's going to be a great meeting. Um, it's a little different, as we all know. I want to make sure for the listening audience as well as for us that I explain the kind of the ground rules, which we um, have done before for these work sessions. Uh, Today's work session, we are not taking public testimony, although we, we encourage folks to listen in. Today's The purpose of today's meeting is to prepare commissioners for our meeting next week on Thursday, the 19th of May, which will be our second official public hearing on the climate-friendly and equitable communities rulemaking. Today, we uh, staff, will, uh, if you recall, staff came uh, to us in March and we had our first public hearing. Toward the end of that hearing, after listening to public testimony, commissioners had some more questions and asked staff to go and refine some certain pieces or certain elements of the CFAC rule. Staff has done that and your packets were sent electronically, I think Thursday or Friday of last week. And some of us also have our physical uh, packets. The purpose of today is for staff to go over the rules, the emerging draft, as well as uh, reflect on the areas of interest that the commission had. The purpose of the meeting is just to listen and ask clarifying questions so that we are better prepared for the actual hearing next week. So please try to frame your questions as questions as opposed to leading other commissioners to a position that you think we should be, that be uh, you can save those uh, comments for next week. Um, I think with that, I don't have to deliberate further. I can just ask the CFEC team to introduce yourselves and start. Thank you, Chair MacArthur. Uh, Bill Holmstrom, uh, DLCD staff, uh, one of the project co-managers. Happy to be with you again today. Did, did you want to wait for other commissioners to to come we looks like we just have two right now well that's a great question um i yeah we were hoping i don't think um esther do you know i know uh, commissioner jacobson may not be joining because i don't think she can be at the may 19th 20th meeting so i wasn't sure i tried to connect with a couple of commissioners this morning and only had was only able to leave voicemails so um, I wasn't sure she would show up, but the other ones I think we're going to planning to appear, be here. If I may, Chair, Commissioner Lelak is trying to get into the room. Yeah. Great. And what about Commissioner Warren, since he's another, I mean, everyone's important, but he's one of the liaisons to this effort. So I don't know if we know if he is planning to attend. I thought people were, but I haven't heard otherwise. But thank you for the question, Bill. Maybe we can wait just a minute until we perhaps get Commissioner Lelak in the room. Yes, but this is Esther. I, I believe there are other folks who are trying to uh, join us via Zoom, and I am having some background issues, um, so I'm still working on that. Thank you. Well, why don't we wait just a minute? Um, if if. Brenda, though, is here. We could introduce Brenda today. Um, She's also, she just also, Chair oh. McCarthy, sorry, she, she should be joining shortly. She, okay. folks are, when you're a panelist on Zoom, you get a specific email from Zoom, kind of from Esther, but Zoom generates it. So um, Brenda's going to go look for that now. And I might just call Commissioner Lelak and see what he's having trouble with. Um, um, former Director Rue is also trying to get in. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, there, Brenda, hello. Uh, Director Bateman. Good afternoon, all. Sorry, I'm late. Good. No, you're, you're not late. It's fine. I think people are having difficulty connecting. So, um, and I won't put you on the spot. We're going to do an official uh, welcome next week at the uh, at the commission uh, conversation. But as long as you're here, um, welcome. It's nice to have you here. Thank you. It's good to be here. Is Steve Shipsey on the line or not? He's not with us in this room. I'll check on him. Thank you.
people. I don't have a juggling act or jokes, so <laughs> I can't occupy the time in that way. <laughs> I do have jokes. I just always forget the punchlines, so it doesn't really work for in the telling. <laughs> Okay. Um, I welcome Commissioner Lelac. Um, my apologies for the, the um, some of Zoom links. Um, and then Commissioner Sandoval. Um, I have sent a separate Zoom link to Commissioner Warren um, and Commissioner uh, Boyer, as well and as, uh, as, well as um, Commissioner Halova. Great, thank you. So I think we sh I think we should get started. We have a lot to cover, and um, I'd like to make sure we have time for that. So um, I think we can get started. I think within a moment or two, they should be able to be linked in. So I'll turn it over to Bill. Thank you, Chair MacArthur. Uh, again, Bill Holmstrom, DLCT staff, uh, one of the project co-managers, along with Kevin Young, who's here with me today. And we'll also be speaking uh, also on the line in terms of, of our uh, staff working on this project in particular, uh, Cody Meyer is here as well. And we should have um, Evan Manvel joining us as well. Uh, he apparently may be in the same boat as some of the other folks is having a difficulty getting on. So we'll, we'll be working on that as well. And uh, we may have other staff join, but uh, the majority of the, the talking today, the presentation will be from myself, Kevin, and Evan. So with Cody here to answer any extra questions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen now, if that's all right. And we'll get started. All right. So um, here's our agenda. You can, we're mostly uh, going to cover uh, key pieces that uh, the commission brought uh, asked us to talk about. Uh, at your, your March meeting. So we'll talk first of all about some of the key changes that we've made since that March meeting. Uh, in particular, there's a couple areas specifically that the commission asked us to address that has to do around timing, uh, bicycle network standards, affordable housing and uh, anti-displacement, particularly in climate friendly areas, uh, large site block standards, uh, equity analysis and, and minimum residential densities uh, came up as kind of an issue that we need to also, uh, I think, discuss with the commission. And that's also, again, particularly in climate friendly areas. So those are the, the, the broad subject areas we expect to discuss with the commission at the work session today. And of course, happy to answer any questions in general uh, from the commission as we move forward. So changes since uh, March. And let me just move my screen around here a little bit so I can see what I'm doing. All right. Thank you. All right, so uh, attachment B of your staff report that you received last week um, is a, a summary of all the rules that are in uh, that we're expecting to, to change as part of this rulemaking. That's a similar to format to what you've seen uh, your last few meetings where we've given you copies of the draft rules and, and that summary is kind of a you know, a, a big picture overview of, of what all those rules mean in kind of, you know, in, in plain language rather than in, in rule ease. Um, in addition, this time around, we've added an extra column, which says, which is a, a summary of the changes we've made in each of those rules since the uh, March commission meeting. And so I do want to highlight that for you uh, as, as someplace where we've uh, taken that extra step to really highlight what are the things that we've changed. Uh, since that March draft. And if you, you look at that, there's a number of rules where we've made uh, minor clarifications and the number of rules where we've made substantive changes in response to um, the feedback we've received, which has been, um, first of all, from you, from the commission at your last meeting in particular, um, g giving us feedback on, on a number of these issues, which we'll talk about here uh, more during this work session, but we've done in response to that. We've also heard from our advisory committee, which we convened um, shortly after the last uh, commission meeting in early April, we met with our advisory committee a 12th time and uh, discussed some of the, the questions that, that the commission brought uh, at your March meeting and, and discussed that with our advisory committee. We also uh, had a number of discussions and, and 
feedback from from technical reviewers from from other state agencies, particular ODOT, as well as uh, folks who are going to be implementing these rules at local governments. Uh, they have, of course, been a, a frequent, uh, our important stakeholder and, and frequent commenter on these issues, and we want to make sure that um, that the rules that we adopt are going to be uh, easily implementable by by local governments, and then uh, other stakeholders. Uh, uh, across the spectrum, of course, uh, that we've heard from and that you, you received uh, feedback from uh, this entire process and have been members of our advisory committee and folks like that. So uh, heard from all those people. Um, also, you know, reviewed the rules with an eye toward clarity and consistency. Um, I want to highlight uh, the work in particular of uh, Ryan Marquardt on our staff is relatively new uh, staff member in the transportation section uh, who, who took some extra time. He has recent, most recently uh, worked with a uh, local government himself here in Oregon. So he, you know, had that eye, that planner's eye, uh, looking at it, making sure that it, you know, things are made sense, that they're consistent. Um, I think in particular, we want to make sure that uh, we knew that the right jurisdictions that were, you know, which rules applied to which jurisdictions was consistent throughout. That was something I, particularly in the Portland metropolitan area, is a little bit different. So we want to make sure we were clear about that. A couple other things like that, using kind of consistent terminology. Um, also on that line, same line, we did have another review, a second review by uh, Steve Shipsey with the Department of Justice to, to look at the lawyer's eye and make sure, you know, all our I's were dotted and T's were crossed. And we had just a few pieces outstanding uh, from that review, but mostly it was just kind of, again, clarity and consistency things. And, and Mr. Shipsey's with us today in case the commission has any other additional questions on that. Um, there's a review of uh, written testimony or summary that the, the staff has put together. Uh, Evan Manville on our staff uh, put a lot of time and effort into that, uh, of, of summarizing what all we heard in those 45 exhibits that you received at your last meeting. And, and summarizing that. So that's available as attachment F in your, uh, to your staff report. Um, we expect to uh, send out an updated version of that document with, with staff's responses and how we've been responsive to each of those points uh, as, as part of your supplemental packet later this week. That's our expectation right now. So keep an eye out for that. So with that, I think we'll jump into the specifics uh, topic areas that we, you asked us to address unless you have any uh, general questions. I'm just going to stop you just for a minute, Bill, sure. because I'm trying to get Anyale in, uh, Vice Chair Holova. I think she is in now. Is that correct? Um, Anyale, I see you're not on. Your mic yes. is muted. Okay, yes. great. I'm and, then, and then also uh, Commissioner Boyer uh, texted me and I tried to give her some information. I'm, I don't see her. Oh, is I don't see her yet. So did the, did the information I give you um, by text help at all, Anyale, the ID and stuff, or not? Uh, I got I got info from somebody else. So okay, perfect, great. So let's just wait. Um, so Barbara is still trying everything she can on two computers. Um, okay, uh, if, if you could ask um, Commissioner Boyer to look for the link from Zoom, that is her panelist. Yeah, I did do that. Okay. So, okay. Um, and I also sent her the ID and passcode as I was trying to also listen to Bill's intro. But yeah. so, but I think, uh, can you give uh, Commissioner Boyer a call directly and maybe give her that information? Is that you okay? Bet, uh, you bet, okay. Esther. You have her phone number and you could do that. Thank you. Okay. I just don't have her phone. Thank you, Chair McArthur. Yes, appreciate that. And I think if with uh, Commissioner Boyer joining us soon, we'll have a full compliment, except I think Katie Jacobson. So, um, and I think she was not necessarily planning to be here. So, why don't we um, turn it back to Bill? Apologize to everybody for the difficulty getting in. Um, but I basically, for those that just joined us, Bill went through kind of an intro of what staff will talk about. So you haven't missed anything. Um, but I do think we need to go into the substance now. So uh, Bill or Cody or whomever is going to continue on, go for it. Thank you, uh, Chair MacArthur. Again, Bill Holmstrom. Uh, we talked about, start jumping about the timing uh, and, and uh, kind of, there was a lot of, I think, questions and concerns in particular around that. So the commission did ask us to, uh, to visit that. And so we have made some changes here. Um, you know, one thing I want to say is, you know, we've uh, designed the rules to, to be used kind of on a constant basis. It's into the future here. Uh, and, and, you know, it's not that they won't be changed in the future. They certainly will. We're, we'll 
we're happy to revisit this in the future. We know there's a lot of changes that we're making and we're not going to get everything right. We think we're doing the right thing generally, but we're, you know, I think the agencies have to make a commitment that we'll revisit these rules as necessary in the future. Um, but, the, you know, the rules are, are built to be used on, a, on, you know, as we go into the future and on a continuing basis. Um, but the, I think we need to, to think about the next few years a little bit differently because that's a time of transition from where we've been before our, our successes that we've had before and um, things we need to change and 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 moving into the, the new kind of way of doing things so um, a, a lot of what the timing piece is about is what do these next few years look like who has to do what and when do they have to do it um, and, and kind of laying that out more clearly and uh, making sure it's it's reasonable. So we have effective dates and deadlines set out in, in both divisions 12 and 44. Division 12 is the transportation plan rules. That's where most of this is I'm going to talk about today is lives. Division 44 uh, are the metropolitan greenhouse gas target rules and uh, those have to, those div, the deadlines in there have to do with um, scenario planning in, in particular uh, this for, for this time around, it's going to be the, the Eugene Springfield and Salem Kaiser areas in particular that are affected by uh, the dates that we're talking about there. So in general, this is what we've been trying to uh, accomplish uh, in terms of our timing requirements, uh, balancing, you know, flexibility uh, with the urgency that we know that we need to accomplish that you've told us that we need to achieve uh, in order to meet our goals, particularly around the climate. Um, we know that uh, the science tells us that we need to act with urgency. So um, as quickly as we can, uh, reasonably to, to make these things actually happen. Uh, that has to be balanced with you know, some flexibility and uh, being able to be reasonable about these so that we can, um, you know, if we put unreasonable timeframes out, they're not gonna happen. So we want things to happen. Uh, we want them to happen quickly. We need to figure out what's the best way of making those things happen quickly. So that's what we've been trying to do. Um, we need to make sure that we're considering available resources, um, financial, staff uh, capacity, um, consultant capacity, all sorts of resources out there that we need to make sure that we're managing. You know, There's lots of different local governments that are affected by these rules. And if all of them are trying to do the same thing at the same time, there may be some bottlenecks there. So we've been trying to, to think about that, uh, that we're coordinating different requirements within these rules, as well as other rules, particularly like the housing rules that you know the, the commission has adopted, making sure that we're not uh, stacking up local governments that are, are affected by those at, at, in, in the next couple of years, too much in any one year. Uh, we've been uh, cognizant of that. And then, um, you know, considering the feedback from those implementing agencies, those local governments that are going to be implementing these rules and 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 their feedback about how how to reasonably achieve these targets. So what we've done uh, in this draft is um, provide uh, in Division Twelve two different versions of of what's we call Rule Twelve. Uh, there's Twelve A and Twelve B that are in your uh, draft rules that we've sent you. Um, and uh, they are two different versions of, of, of timings that the, the commission could choose from. I'll talk about that here in a few slides. Um, the other kind of big thing we've done is we kind of restructured um, how local governments could ask the commission for uh, alternative dates. So that's an optional process. We, we used to call that the work program. Um, I think we found that that calling it that and the requirements that went along with that, I think, um, set expectations uh, for local governments uh, a little bit higher than maybe what staff thought they, they we were going to get and so we wanted to make sure that we were um you know this is a we don't want local governments to spend a lot of time putting this app, you know submission together uh we want them to actually be working on the work so we, we've tried to calibrate that um the the alternative dates like i said is formally called the work program um we we've tried to simplify those submittal requirements um I think we asked for five different things, now we're asking for three different things. We just kind of tried to pare this back to be real clear. We're just looking for you to, to sit down, take some thought about what, what order does it make sense to do things in and um, when does it make sense to do these things based on everything else that's going on, all the resources that are available. Um, we've removed the requirement that they be re submitted regionally because 
uh, that was seen as a barrier to being able to successfully uh, do this work. Um, and so that's no longer a requirement. They're allowed to if they wish to. Um, this continues to require local governments to tell us when they expect to update their transportation system plan as part of this work. Um, We've connected it to the, the work program in Division 44, which the Eugene Springfield uh, area and the Salem Kaiser area are going to be required to do. Um, uh, we've, we've joined those, we've tried to connect those requirements together so uh, they can be submitted together as one thing to uh, the department and the commission. So there's not separate kind of pieces there. And then uh, it, it continued to be approved by the commission itself. I did see a hand up uh, from the deputy director. Did you have something? Hi, Bill. I just wonder if any of the commissioners are like me and want to kind of follow along. I find that at least the A and B section were on page 36, begin on page 36 of their packet. Is that helpful to kind of point out? I, I didn't know if the work program is found there as well. Yeah, so um, thank you for that. Um, and I apologize for not putting those page numbers up here. Uh, it is um, section three in, in in either one of those rules, either 12A or 12B, either section three uh, has to do with those requirements for those alternative dates. In both. Right, I see that now, and and yeah. that includes the work plan. That that's what we're calling the work plan now. Is, yes, is alternative, alternative dates. dates. Thank, yeah. That's right. I'm slow to the slow the game. Sorry. Go back on mute here. Thank you. You're welcome. So we, we do have. Uh, evaluation criteria for these work programs. Uh, we expect them to act with urgency. Um, you know, it, people can't just put all their dates 10 years out and say, oh, that's when we'll get to it. Um, that that wouldn't necessarily meet, you know, the staff looking at that wouldn't necessarily meet the, think that met the criteria. Uh, even though we've removed the requirement for the alternative dates to be submitted regionally, we do require the actions that folks are taking to be coordinated regionally. So we expect people to actually talk with uh, the other jurisdictions in their regions uh, and coordinate to the extent possible uh, the, the work that's happening in those places. In particular, it's going to be important with this next bullet with those regions that are, have requirements under Division 44 in the Eugene Springfield and Salem Kaiser areas, they're going to be doing additional work at a regional level. And so we want to make sure all the work that they're have to do together or individually as jurisdictions uh, is, is coordinated and, and, and thoughtful in how they sequence that work together. Uh, and, and every place needs to make sure that they're putting that work in a, in a logical sequence. And, and there's going to be kind of different ways of doing that in different places. But there's some kind of base piece of, the, of this work that we know aren't going to be part of the alternative dates that we know are going to happen early, having to do with climate friendly areas, and then what is going to follow up on that. And so I think we're, we're going to have those conversations with folks. And then, of course, uh, we want to make sure folks are considering funding and resource availability. That'll be a big part of the conversations that we're having uh, with local governments. And that, that's what that final bullet says is, you know, we're, we're not just saying, you know, throwing out this rule and saying, all right, you guys go and, and give us something and come back to us. Our expectation is that staff is that we're going to continue to have conversations with local governments about uh, the, the state's ability to help fund this work, um, what makes sense, what other places are doing. Um, you know, different communities are at different places in terms of their staff capacity, in terms of how old their TSP is. And there's lots of different pieces to this. Some, some places already may have done some of the work that might be necessary here. So we just want to make sure that we're respecting each of those places and, and, and where they are uh, in their process. We know there's one jurisdiction that uh, wants to, to start their TSP already. They're, they're ready to go. They're ready, you know, aside from this process, they want to get going um, and just as part of what their city council is telling them to do. So like, how are we going to work that into everything else that they need to do? Those are conversations that we're going to need to have uh, with each of those local governments, and it's going to look different in different places. So this is a tool to give us flexibility and uh, to work cooperatively with local governments. So real quick about the options, uh, 12A and 12B. Um, there's a table uh, in page, I think, 12 or so of, of your staff report um, that that's, talks about this in quite a bit of detail. Um, so please review that if, if you're curious about what exactly each of these different sets of rules does. But in general, um, option A is the more urgent 
uh, version is, is very similar in, in a lot of ways to what your March draft was. In some cases, um, we have added a little bit more time uh, for local governments. I think there's only maybe one one thing where we've made it shorter, and I can't remember that what that is off the top of my head. Maybe Kevin, you remember, but um, everything everything is pretty much the same or slightly more time uh, because we've we've heard from local governments that, that that's just necessary to, to make this work. So that's what we think is you know reasonably the most urgent kind of set of options um, moving forward. But we we also heard from the commission that the commission would like options. So we're providing um, uh, option B, which provides more time. Um, usually about six to 12 months um, for each of those options. And, and sometimes they're more like two years. It just depends on the type of thing it is. Um, there's a whole range of different types of times and, and deadlines that are affected by this rule. So uh, you know, we, we try to be thoughtful about that and what made sense uh, in a logical sense when you're looking at that one whole column or the other whole column. Transportation system plans, we've heard from the commission that you wanted options on that. We've heard obviously from, uh, I think, advocates who are very keen to make sure that there is a deadline. Uh, and we, we haven't provided one so far. We, we've said, you know, we expect transportation system plans to be updated over time. There's a lot of triggers along the way that, that nudge um, local jurisdictions to move in that direction in the rules. Uh, but we, I think we've been reluctant to put a, a specific timeline in there because of, I think, some of the, you know, uh, resource constraints at the state level that we want to make sure that we're able to to provide uh, for a TSP update for everyone that is going to need one by that time. And, and that was, uh, you know, working with our partners, I think that was a, a tough thing to think about. We, we've come to an agreement on that in, in option A, that there would be uh, a deadline for jurisdictions that are over 5,000 in population outside of the Portland metropolitan area uh, would have a deadline in 2029. And that's um, what we were able to, to negotiate essentially with ODOT to figure out like that's that's what we were comfortable with as a state to uh, to, to put out there for a, for a deadline if the, if the commission wished to do that. Uh, if you don't wish to do that, option B doesn't have that same deadline. It's the same kind of as what we had before where um, we expect TSPs to be updated. We expect if you send us alternate dates that you tell us when you think you're going to be able to do that, but we don't have a specific deadline in there. So uh, any questions about the the two options here? Uh, I can't see everybody the way this is configured. So if any, somebody has a question, just go ahead and ask. I, we don't have to be formal here. Chairman Carter, if I could just ask um, about Commissioner Boyer. Esther has shared that she was able to join by phone, but I see her in the attendees. I'm wondering if Commissioner Boyer should be brought over to panelists so that she can ask questions if she has them. Thank you. I appreciate that. I know that she was she tried on two different computers to get in. So thank, thank you, Commissioner Boyer, for um, coming in by phone, but we'll try to get you in a place where you can actually ask questions. Thanks, Kirsten. Um, I was just for, uh, back to the... Um, the presentation, I, I think it's great. And I also noticed in the packet, uh, in the staff report, you have that really nice matrix that talks about, that says on, you know, one axis, it says, um, or one first column, here's what the draft was. It was presented to the commission in March and, and the outside world. And here is what, how we've, here's the options that we've changed it to and, um, and revised it. So, I found that extremely useful to look at for the timing elements for other things. I'm not sure if you have the ability to put that slide up there here now, but um, I think it's really clear the way that presents the issue. So perhaps at the at the hearing, we could maybe see a little bit more of that matrix in front of us, but um, that's, I guess, to be to, determined. Any questions, though, about the substance? Um, any clarification questions about timing options that is in your packet and will be discussed next week. Don't see any hands up again. I can't really see anybody, but <laughs> I'm not sure why I can't configure this in a different way. My apologies, but again, I don't see anybody. And uh, so uh, continue on. Thank you, Chair. Uh, one more slide on timing, and that's just around Division 44, which also has some timelines on it. This hasn't changed as far as I know, Cody can raise new just wave his hands if something's different but um uh this is pretty much the the same as what it was before uh, in terms of uh the requirements yeah cody go ahead 
Uh, thanks, Bill. Cody Meyer, Land Use Transportation Planner uh, with the department. Uh, yeah, we did have um, some very minor tweaks to add a little bit more time um, to the work plan for uh, Eugene Springfield and Salem Kaiser. Um, and so that we did put in six months um, at their request to have that. And then just flagging, these are the, the default dates in here for the scenario plan and the corresponding transportation system plan amendments and comp plan amendments that would be necessary to implement the scenario plan. Um, but it requires uh, these two regions to submit a work program with what dates they think are doable. And then um, commission has um, the ultimate decision on whether those are acceptable or not. Great. And so if we don't have any questions, I think we can continue on. Thank you, uh, Chair MacArthur. So we're going to move on to uh, bicycle network standards. And um, I just want to talk real quick about, about some of the changes that we've made here. So the, the rules in general for, for our bicycle network planning, uh, they are focused on and um, direct local governments to plan for a connected, safe, low stress, direct, and uh, bicycle network that is comfortable for all ages and abilities. And it does get into some more specifics about uh, putting together a connected network and what that looks like and the types of facilities that we expect on that connected network. Um, the commission asked us at the last meeting to uh, include NACTO standards as uh, part, of our, part of our rule. So we've had uh, some conversations with the Department of Transportation on this. Uh, and, you know, they, they have some concerns about kind of the specifics of how this is worded. And, and, and so we're not stepping on necessarily, you know, we're, we're doing planning level work and that we're not stepping on the toes of engineers on in the field who need to do their work and have flexibility to do their work. So we're trying to navigate those waters. Um, the draft rule uh, requires, and this is, this is not really different. This is just, you know, restating that uh, the, requires that the local governments adopt standards uh, for bicycle system planning and facilities. So we expect them to adopt some standards. Uh, when, they're, when they're looking at what those standards are, they, those standards must result in a safe, comfortable, or safe, low stress and comfortable experience for people of all ages and abilities. One of the changes we made ahead of the March um, meeting, if you recall, is we did define specifically in the rule what all ages and abilities means in this context. And that's in line with the NACTO recommendations. Um, the, the last piece of the thing that we've changed here is we've we've been specific that local governments, when they're adopting these standards, may adopt, they, they adopt local standards in part of their local plan, uh, but they, they base those on um, NACTO and ODOT publications. And we've, we've put three specific publications in the rule uh, that the local governments may use, use the term may, they don't have to use these, they don't have to use all of them, they can use one of them. Some, you know, in our conversations with ODOT, some of these, it doesn't really make sense to use one of them without the other. Um, some of them have kind of different pieces of the puzzle to them. So um, we're, we're trying to be inclusive here and, and let, you know, we're trying to get to a certain place where we can't necessarily be super prescriptive about how they get there because of, of the constraints that we're in. Uh, but we're setting out the, the, the large picture goals that you know they must result in a safe, most stress and comfortable experience for people of all ages and abilities. That's our expectation. That's the commission's expectation. Uh, we're trying to give them the guideposts to get there. Uh, you, know, o, o, you know, I'll say, you know, the Department of Transportation said would be more comfortable if we use the terminology adopt guidelines we, we pushed back on that said, you know, we need to adopt standards. Uh, so, you know, we, we, this has been a, um, this has been something we've been working a lot and I know you're, you, you have heard from and are going to hear from uh, advocates who, who say don't use that ODOT publication, but that wasn't going to be a, uh, an option uh, in our conversations with ODOT. They thought it was very important to include that. Uh, and, and I think that's just, that's, that's where we are. So. And that's that's all I have to say on, on the bicycle network standards. Are there any questions on that? Uh, well, so it's just this is Robin. So uh, I was just wondering. So the reason for doing it this way is twofold. One, because ODAT had some concerns about the flexibility that engineers need when they're actually doing the design. Um, and is that correct? Is that a correct statement? 
Yeah, Chair MacArthur, I don't know if I'm, I'm doing their position justice, but I think that's that's accurate, yes. Um, you know, it might be nice to have ODOT directly at our commission meeting next week so I can we can hear directly what their concerns are so that we can um, address those. It sounds like you, you've attempted to as staff. I'm not implying you haven't, but um, I, I just I still kind of wonder why we can't just go with the full on NACTO, but that's just my thought at this point. Um, so then, so what you're offering is an is a way by saying using the term may, you are offering a way to allow for that flexibility at the local level based on particular conditions that might be there um, in place already, and they're trying to modify a roadway or right away, for example, and put in bicycle facilities. Is that what you're thinking? Is on this? Yeah, I mean, we we expect them to adopt standards, right? We expect them to have a complete and connected network of, of excellent facilities that beat all these rules. Um, does that mean every single facility necessarily meets every one of those? Well, if there's maybe another way of connect, making that connection, maybe not. Maybe there's a certain stretch where you can't meet the six feet, you have to have five and a half feet or something. You know, there's, there's all kinds of, sure. of yeah, got you know, it. things that are site specific that I think that I think that's where that concern comes from. Um, you know, there's there's lots of other things, storm drainage. You know, who know, who knows what the other issues are that come up that you know make it maybe nece not necessarily being able to meet the letter of every recommendation at every single facility. Um, we're trying to get to a place where we have a, an excellent network of uh, connected network all over these communities, um, and, and that's that's where we're trying to get to. Super. That's real, I, and it looks like you're you're you've tried to do that, so that's appreciated. Um, other commissioners again i can't see anyone's hands so just go ahead and jump in and ask a clarifying question for bill um if you have any not hearing anyone i think you can continue on thank you thank you uh, chair MacArthur. at this point i'm going to uh hand the slides over to my colleague uh, kevin young who's going to be talking about affordable housing and anti-displacement within climate friendly areas. Kevin. Thank you, Bill. Um, good afternoon, Chair MacArthur, Vice Chair Holoba, Commissioners. I'm Kevin Young, a Senior Urban Planner with the department. Uh, can you move to the next slide, please, Bill? Um, so at our first uh, commission hearing back in end of March, um, one of the things the commission asked for was a, a revision to the rules to require local governments to adopt uh, measures to promote affordable housing and address anti-displacement in climate friendly areas. And so the uh, revised set of rules that you have in the packet does that. Uh, the section itself is in rule, rule 0315 of division 12. So the part of the, within the transportation planning rules. Uh, and essentially the rule requires a few things, a few things. First of all, identification of strategies concurrent with zoning. So the timing of that uh, work is not, not at the study phase, but actually when the local governments are deciding on and zoning uh, their climate friendly areas. And the reason we want that concurrent, of course, is so that we're proactive about uh, negative impacts that might otherwise occur. Um, the rules do not set any required number of strategies. I think we expect a good faith effort, um, as we do with all of the housing production strategy work. Frankly, that this is this is kind of a, a part of that of that effort. Um, <clears throat> and the rules require the local governments to identify all ongoing and recently adopted strategies to to number one to promote affordable housing development. So they may already be doing a number of things to promote affordable housing, uh, and that would also benefit climate friendly areas. So it would be appropriate to bring, bring those forward, but also uh, new commitments to uh, pursue strategies to um, optimize affordable housing development in these areas. And similarly, uh, the rules would require uh, the local government to identify ongoing and recently adopted strategies to prevent displacement. Um, and one important component here is that uh, you may recall from our uh, anti-displacement and gentrification uh, toolkit, um, there are different techniques that make sense at different points in uh, a neighborhood's life, if you will. There are typologies. And so there are some measures that may make sense um, 
for a neighborhood that's experiencing active gentrification that might not make sense in an area that's maybe could conceivably be threatened by gentrification. Um, and so this, this rule asks local governments to specifically look at um, you know, how their climate friendly areas would kind of um, shake out in terms of these different um, neighborhood typologies. And of course, we're not expecting the potential for displacement in all areas that may not be the case, um, or at least displacement of underserved populations. Um, but where that is a possibility, the rules would require a concurrent adoption of effective strategies. And that's that's pretty much sums it up. I'll pause here. It looks like I have a question. Uh, so when when you said neighborhood typologies, is that in reference to the typologies that were identified with the anti-displacement toolkit, like early gentrification, those typologies? That's correct, yes. Okay. Okay. I just wanted to make sure it wasn't some other typologies related to like building form or anything like that. No. no. Okay. No. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Any other questions on this component? Yeah, Kevin, I'll, I'll uh, just ask a quick, is this all we're going to talk about affordable housing and anti-displacement measures today, or will we revisit this later in the work session? I'm just curious. Yeah, that's a good question. I will be speaking a little bit later on about minimum densities and um, kind of more globally, um, the issue of housing affordability, um, but not necessarily subsidized affordable housing. So depending on your comment or questions, feel free to ask now or later. No, that's okay. I, I can certainly wait. I just, I, I know this has been such a, an important piece of our um, rulemaking effort from the beginning. And uh, obviously you could speak about this for an hour and a half, I'm sure. Um, and we've talked extensively about it. Um, obviously we heard uh, more about it last week from, from a, a group of, uh, of important organizations and voices. And I, I do hope that we just talk about how we might respond to that later. And uh, and we've also just talked about how 30% of the housing um, could be accommodated, needs to be accommodated in the climate friendly areas, but uh, that local governments still may plan for up to 130% of their housing need, unless I um, am recalling that incorrectly. So just it's, it's just such a big topic and um, so important to this entire rulemaking effort. You bet, absolutely. And I appreciate the, the, the comment. Uh, Commissioner Lelak, I don't mean to give it short shrift. Um, you know, an example that we might uh, look at, for example, you know, the uh, housing production strategy um, list that we have, I think has over 110 different strategies that local governments can use to promote affordable housing, um, to mitigate for displacement. Um, you know, an example uh, of a tool that works kind of universally to support affordable housing and it would not be anticipated to, you know, to create uh, or would be anticipated to mitigate for displacement would be um, use of CDBG uh, community development block grant or low income housing tax credit funds to build affordable housing in climate friendly areas. That's a tool that would get a green light across the spectrum, regardless of the neighborhood typology. Um, an, an example of a tool that might not work in all instances would be a tax increment financing, which um, is a tool that gets used a lot um, and it, it does a lot of good things, but it's also important to recognize that at, at its root, tax increment financing is dependent on property tax values rising. And so for existing residents, um, what we wouldn't want to see would be pricing folks out of neighborhoods. And so you know, that's an area where a local government would want to plan a little and think about how do we support um, folk, you know, circumstances for existing low income residents so that we don't uh, displace folks. Just to just to kind of flesh out what I'm talking about. It, it's all very abstract. Um, all right. Yeah. Are there other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, this is uh, Robin. Uh, so um, I appreciate Commissioner Lelex question because there this is this is a really critical part of the rulemaking effort um, because from the very beginning even in our um, charge to staff for this work 
we talked about equity, affordable housing, you know, housing supply, um, home ownership, and that sort of thing. And that's why I believe that staff has worked so hard to connect the House Bill 2001 and 2003 pieces to this work. And it's kind of foundational. I mean, it's, it's actually very exciting to me that those other um, rules are in place. And now that we have tools, and so I'd see, I, is it safe to say that this approach actually helps localize these decisions because a housing needs analysis is done at the local level. To me, if I'm a local planner or a housing specialist, I'm looking at the results of my housing needs analysis and I'm looking at where I should put, um, you know, z- zoning and other kinds of strategies in place to accommodate that need. And some of that housing will be in a CFA and some of that housing will be in the non-CFA areas of the community. And these strategies are in place to really uh, not only zone, but actually bring out and, and encourage development of the kinds of housing that a local area needs. It, is that a correct statement? It's absolutely a correct statement. I think you've said it much better than I could say it, but yeah, it 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 folds in really well with the housing production strategy uh, framework from that was provided by uh, House Bill 2003. So, um, you know, this is this is I think as Bill said early on, you know, we're going to learn, we're going to learn from this, um, and most particularly in terms of. How do we do things well in climate friendly areas? And it's not going to be a one size fits all because there are different cities. You know, there's a lot of different tools that they can use and some will make sense in some communities and some will make sense in others. And so we're, we're really trying to look at the goal, the important thing, but provide a lot of different paths to get to where we, we want to get. Thank you. Appreciate yeah. that. Yeah. All right, I'll pause for any additional questions. Okay, I think we can move on to the next slide. So I'll touch on the next topic as well, uh, large site block standards. Uh, Next slide, please. This is pretty straightforward. Um, Again, at our uh, first hearing at the end of March, Uh, commission provided direction that, you know, an issue was raised of, well, you know, if there were a large site that were designated as a climate friendly area, say a a large site that had either not been developed or maybe for some reason, a large scale redevelopment was warranted, would it make sense to apply a smaller block link standard in that circumstance? Um, Because as you recall, the standard that we had prior was sort of a compromise because what we we're not wanting to do was to disincentivize redevelopment in existing established areas where uh, street dedication and street improvement would be a significant hurdle to redevelopment. That's why for the development site that's less than five and a half acres, uh, we set block length at 500 feet or less and then require a pedestrian <clears throat> through block easement if that block length is greater than 350 feet. However, for the large site, and that's defined here as more than five and a half acres. Uh, any, any development site of that scale, the requirements would say the local government shall establish a block length of 350 feet or less. And I'll note we've revised our, our reference to the exceptions allowed um, to uh, section 330 of the rule, just for clarity. Um, and there are a number of exceptions based on topography, existing uh, built conditions, um, you know, freeways, that kind of thing. So um, that's basically how this rule would function. Are there any any questions about that? Okay. All right, I, I see none. So um, I will turn now, uh, I think, turn things over to Evan. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, we wanted to um, circle back on the equity analysis um, issue and exactly uh, what we're uh, requiring when. So next slide. Um, so in looking at uh, kind of the the equity analysis overarching thing, um, we realized that we were asking a lot um, and people were feeling overwhelmed by it. So we wanted to split that into two pieces. And we wanted to do, do good equity work in, in all the decisions, but um, kind of more in depth 
uh, during the major decisions. So uh, we split it up into something called engagement focused equity analysis. Um, and this is all in, on uh, pages 48 and 49 of attachment D if you want the actual rule language, but this is plain language version of it. Um, so in, in engagement focused equity analysis, uh, where we ask communities to really engage with those underserved populations we've identified and uh, develop key outcomes for the decision um, to really gather all both qualitative quantitative information uh, think about intersectionality um, and then kind of do some independent like okay let me analyze this uh, this proposed challenges and, and kind of see how this might impact um, our equity outcomes that we've identified and you know do, say okay if we're let's not advance inequity let's advance equity so adopt strategies to make sure that that um, the decisions are moving that forward and, and reporting back to those populations who've generously um, engaged and shared their insights and wisdom so that's kind of an engagement focused equity analysis it would happen during minor transportation system plan updates um, during the study of climate friendly areas um, significant road expansions, which are uh, section 830, that's what we call them. <laughs> um, and the really small communities when they're doing their transportation system plans, the, those with under 5,000 populations. So um, that's kind of the level of equity analysis that uh, the rules now have um, for those decisions. Um, next slide. So the second uh, thing is this this thing that was overwhelming to some people, <laughs> and this would only apply under um, major transportation system uh, plan updates. So this is this is the thing that we joke you know we've joked about oh a doctoral thesis could be write, written about the assessing and documenting and acknowledging um, all the past decisions that have played into this, um, and we imagine again uh, so so that so. All the, the major equity analysis requires all the things in the previous one because engaging the voices and hearing the real stories um, is a key part of the process of getting an equitable outcome. So, so everything on the previous slide happens during a major TSP update as well as the, the other four items on this slide. So it's, it's that um, really looking at um, where our land use and transportation and housing policies and climate change and racism have impacted those uh, populations, um, the underserved populations that we're trying to address um, equity issues with. So that's that's items two and three on here. Um, and it may be very community specific. It may be broader. Um, consultants may really specialize in like, OK, we understand here, here are the things in, in US practices and Oregon practices that apply. And it, you know, a lot of consultants do transportation system plans that have similar elements across communities, and this may have some of that as well. Hopefully, there's some local data there, um, but uh, until we do these, we're, we're not going to see exactly how robust that is. Um, so, uh, and then item four is really identifying some geographic areas, um, and we change this from. Uh, um, uh, high concentrations to significantly disproportionate concentrations of underserved populations because uh, one of the comment letters from the city of Springfield uh, rightly showed up, showed that inequity is sometimes an absence of certain populations. So it's it's been exclusionary. So it's not just where we have high populations of, of underserved population or high concentrations of underserved populations, but um, very high or low um, kind of um, so that, that's item four is kind of doing some uh, geographic mapping of that. And the last thing is uh, developing key performance measures. Um, as you may be aware in the key performance measures in um, section uh, 0905 of division 12, um, a lot of those have equity components. It's like how well is transit serving underserved populations or this or that or the other thing. So uh, that that's the major equity analysis that we ask communities to do. Uh, upon doing a major transportation system plan update, as you've, we've talked about, um, those can happen every five to 20 years. Um, hopefully, hopefully we'll get the larger, the larger cities doing more frequently than 20 years. But um, yeah, so that, that, that's uh, how we tried to resolve that, that concern, um, asking for something in depth, but uh, only one time every few, every several years. Uh, yeah, a couple of hands went up.
Uh, uh, I think my hand went up first. Where, where, where is the part that comes kind of after this, after the developing of key performance measures, and then that's kind of measuring, but obviously you have actions, and then you have to see, does the actions meet the performance? So it's, it, it, I feel like it's missing the last two parts. It's like, what are you actually doing? And then how are you uh, testing or um, validating that it's meeting the measures? Um, Cody, do you want to speak to performance measures or Bill and how that kind of that loop is closed? You're more, you've more had your. Um, and the answer. reason I bring it up is, that, you know, they, mm -hmm. a lot of times we periodically get these, depending on what organization's doing it, right? They do the state of the of the situation depending on what population they're serving, and it's always dismal. And then the next time they do it, it's the same and usually worse. Yep, so, it, it's, it's a great question. <laughs> yeah, and then we say we should do better, and then yeah. five years later we should do better. So what happens to the like, yeah, the rest? Cody of that? will solve this for you, I'm sure. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Halova. So to answer your question, the rules have uh, requirements for a major report to be due by uh, cities and counties every four or five years, depending on um, where they're at with their uh, their metropolitan planning work for the federal government. And as a part of that report, um, that really asks for um, the status of corrective actions that have been taken over the planning period or the uh, reporting period, rather. And then the um, looking at the uh, following up on any you know tracking on the key performance measures from equity analysis. So uh, we have a number of um, transportation and land use performance measures that are required, but the reporting also asks for um, a description on um, tracking on those as well on the equity analysis performance measures that a city might adopt on their own or develop on their own. So there's a there are potentially long, these major uh, transportation PSP updates happen in a long time frame, but there's reporting that happens on a more frequent basis that, right. that includes these equity. Uh, how, how are they tracking according to the key performance measures in relation to the equity? Uh, yeah, the, correct. So that would be rolled in into those reports that go on a, every four or five years that cities and counties will be reporting to the agency on. Any follow up, uh, Vice Chair? Uh, no. I mean, I, my next question was thinking, but I think I know the answer, which was uh, I guess each jurisdiction it comes up with their own equity uh, key performance measures? Um, that's kind of a two part answer to that. Well, uh, Cody, you want to, you would more precisely answer that. Well, I, I think to answer that uh, question, it's really, yeah, when the equity rules in here are asking um, to consult folks on the ground and come up with the actions that, you know, what are the outcomes that we as a city uh, want to see happening and then to come up with the key performance measures and then to track those and so those are you know we don't know right now because that's context and situational um to doing the equity work thank you and then, then just to follow up a jurisdiction then once they establish that they would then it's, they would have sort of they have their own performance measures or standards and that that might be different from a neighboring city um, or another city downstate, but the reason for that is because um, it was a local process that used input from citizens and interest groups in that particular area relative to those particular issues. Is that correct to say that that way? I think so, yes, Jim MacArthur. Thank you. I see Commissioner Lelak has his hand up. Thank you. Um, and this is probably a basic question. I should know the answer. Um, but, and I really, I appreciate the clarity that was just provided with, with all of this piece. My question is, is, is the, is the, and, and I, and I get that any TSP update is a comprehensive plan amendment is the equity analysis, uh, and the performance measures, are they adopted as part of the comprehensive plan update, meaning that they're also appealable or could they be adopted simultaneously as part of the package, but they're not appealable. I just, I, I can expect local governments may want or may seek clarity on that. I'm just, I just don't know the answer. I, I probably should at this point in the process. 
Thanks. Uh, it's a good question, Commissioner Lelac. Um, Bill, I, I think this is in section 105 that as part of a TSP, um, this is a component of it and I, I'm not an attorney, so I, I can't speak to the appealability. I don't know if um, Steve or Bill, you wanna talk about that? Is Steve on the line? If not, I think it'd be useful to have him at the next meeting of answer there. I don't know if he's still on the line or not. Here, Steve, Steve is here. Yeah, oh, great, here. Steve. And, and so Commissioner Lelak, would you repeat which aspect is appealable? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Uh, just the local governments have to perform the major equity analysis and then and and adopt performance measures. Um, and they're doing that during or as a part of the TSP update. My, my question is, is just given that this is new territory, the which and I think it's very important territory, but is the with the equity analysis uh, analysis and or the performance measures um, be appealable as you know as a standalone item somebody could say you know your equity analysis didn't go far enough or your performance measures aren't measuring what we think you should measure you should be measuring these things i was just curious if that's yeah. just part of yeah just a question i'm just not sure no it's it's a good question and i think it would have a little to do with how the local government went about adopting those you know if they adopted them or if they um, considered them inputs into that ultimate TSP option, which is what I would I would think they would want to do. Um, but they may, you know, a local government might choose to make some adoption that's kind of final so that they can lock a piece in place if it isn't challenged. Um, you know, we've seen uh, local governments kind of go about it both ways with some UGV work where they've tried to lock in a piece um, that feeds into a subsequent decision. So I, I, you know, I think, I think a local government would have some ability to control how they did that. And, but I, I would say, suspect that overall, we would see those coming as challenges to the final adoption of the TSP. I don't know if that got to it because that's a classic attorney maybe answer, depends answer, but uh, I, I don't, you know, that's my best guess at this point. Might you have more clarity by a week from Tuesday, or is that going to be it? <laughs> Just curious. No, because I, I, I don't really know how the local government would approach it. Got it. Okay. But there's there are different paths that have different consequences for local jurisdictions, so it might be at some point useful to help them understand what those paths mean, um, and and so they have an idea of how to, how to respond to those things. So. Anyway, um, any follow up, Commissioner Lelak, on that question? No, thank you. Any other? Oh, oh Commissioner Sandoval. Yeah. So at, at some point in the, the documents, we were talking about leading by race. And so here I see, I guess, one, one question kind of directly calling that out. But um, I don't see it in other ones. Can you? Um, I guess talk a little bit more about about the reasoning behind that. Sure, Commissioner Sandoval. Um, there, uh, racism. So, climate and racism are the two specific um, dimensions that we have here beyond the the kind of the universe that's going on transportation, land use, and housing, um, and so. Uh, we didn't um, in section three here, um, we specifically called out, hey, let's look at racism in, deep, more, in more detail. So um, that, that is a place where we think uh, we're leading with race more so than some other dimensions of um, discrimination and inequity. Uh, and that's kind of the, the balance that we um, wanted to have is, is let's look overall at all how the decisions have harmed or are likely to harm underserved populations, um, discrimination against poor people, people with disabilities, uh, people experiencing homelessness, um, uh, LGBTQIA, you know, for example, those populations, and then have another deeper look into, into race. So um, that's kind of the balance that we had. Uh, we thought both were important, but specifically wanted to call out racism. Um, so that that's that what that was the thinking, um, and uh, yeah. Great, thank you. 
Thank you, Commissioner Sandoval. Other commissioners have questions for Evan or Cody on this. I don't see any other hands up when I toggle through. So um, keep going. All right, it looks like we've reached the end of our agenda. Um, and I'll be talking about minimum residential densities, which is something we've we've heard a lot about. Um, I know that um, the commission has been hearing concerns. We heard some at our first hearing um, regarding uh, whether climate friendly area requirements, including minimum residential densities would uh, limit the variety of available housing types in climate friendly areas, would uh, increase housing costs, uh, provide few ownership opportunities, and whether they generally would set the bar too high uh, in terms of development that we, we want to see. And, and if we set the bar too high, are we actually uh, disincentivizing development with minimum residential densities? So to kind of talk through this, I wanted to just start with you know, the question, the fundamental question, why CFAs? Why, why are we requiring climate friendly areas? Well, I think, I think everyone uh, here understands that land use and transportation are inextricably linked. There, there's a relationship between the two and, and frankly, the patterns of development we've seen in the last several decades um, with single use zoning uh, have not uh, provided uh, as, as good access to alternative transportation options, alternatives to uh, automobile trips in terms of meeting daily needs. We do know that walkable mixed use areas significantly reduce reliance on vehicle trips. So if we have a mixture of uses and we have jobs and housing and services in close proximity, it makes it easier to walk, to bike, to use transit. Um, and housing and employment densities both support walking, biking, and transit. I think it's also important to note that climate-friendly area requirements will affect a small portion of cities and will leave other areas available for development under existing zoning. So this is an area where we are actually, in, next slide please, we're providing um, additional housing opportunities above and beyond where cities are planning you know, low density, medium density, high density, employment, um, we're, we're saying let's provide some opportunities for a mixture of, of housing types, a mixture of uh, employment opportunities, and so on. And so we're, yeah, I, I think as Commissioner uh, Lee Lack mentioned uh, earlier, yeah, it's 130% is really what we're talking about. So, so on top of the framework where cities have already established their residential land needs and they've zoned these areas. We're now saying, additionally, let's, let's provide zoned capacity for additional housing and employment opportunities in these, in these climate friendly areas where it doesn't currently exist or it may not currently exist at the level um, for which we're planning here. Another important point is that climate friendly areas will impact residential land supply only to the extent that they're successful. Uh, obviously, we hope they'll be successful. They need to be successful if we're going to meet um, our goals in terms of um, climate pollution reduction. Um, but if uh, it doesn't happen, um, cities will continue to plan for to accommodate the residential uh, land needs as they have previously. Um, so, so we are basically setting the table for development to happen. Um, we are looking at tools to incentivize that development and of course to promote affordable housing development, minimize uh, displacement uh, that, that could occur in these areas. But, but essentially at the end of the day, it's largely going to be a market response uh, to these standards. We've made some changes to the rules over time. We started out with really what was kind of a one size fits all of, you know, hey, let's let's aim for the sky. Let's let's say you gotta allow building heights that are super tall and, you know, higher densities. Uh, we heard very clearly, it's not a one size fits all. Um, and so the rules 
uh, now that you see in front of you allow flexibility for uh, local governments to designate less intensive climate friendly areas outside of their primary CFA area. So the rules require local governments to designate a primary climate friendly area that's at least 25 acres in size, but they are welcome to designate other climate friendly areas elsewhere at a lesser intensity. And that may be more compatible in some com communities. That may be a better, frankly, a better way forward in terms of getting the, the jobs housing balance um, that we're wanting to see. The other point is that um, there's an alternative path um, you know, there's been a lot of reaction to minimum densities and, and the requirement for minimum densities, but I think it's important to come back to there's another path that's available for local governments, which is the outcome oriented approach where a local government says, hey, we, we think we have existing zoning code or we're developing a zoning code that we think will accomplish what you're needing to achieve in climate friendly areas, and it would not require the local government to apply minimum residential densities. So there, there's another path available. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> um, and then some important kind of getting down into the weeds a little bit in terms of how the rules are applied. I think it's important to note too that minimum densities are not applied to mixed use development. So any building that includes a mix of residential and office or residential and commercial or what have you, we would not, the local government would not be uh, required to apply a minimum density standard at all. We have also, uh, in addition to that, we have in this last draft uh, included an allowance for a local government to require ground floor commercial and office uses in climate friendly areas. This is a tool that some local governments use. We're not saying it should be adopted everywhere. It may not make sense everywhere. But I will say that making this available to a local government basically allows a local government who's following the prescriptive path to avoid applying minimum densities if they don't wish to. So essentially, you say, okay, we want ground floor commercial and office. You put as many residential units above that as you want to, as long as we have a, there is a 2.0 FAR requirement, as long as the the uh, development meets that level of intensity, you're good to go. No minimum density is applied. Another uh, new tweak that we made to the rules is to allow um, adaptive reuse of existing buildings. So, um, you know, one of the things I've heard from historic preservation advocates is that sometimes the most climate friendly approach is to not tear down the existing building, but to repurpose it. And so we recognize that applying minimum densities in that circumstance could actually incentivize demolition of buildings that might be productively repurposed. So the latest draft of rules allows for adaptive reuse of existing buildings. They may or may not be designated historic, doesn't matter. Uh, it's a provision that allows more flexibility. Lastly, I'll note that uh, your staff report um, does kind of a deep dive in terms of the housing types that uh, can be allowed in climate friendly areas. So we looked at density, we looked at the implications for small lot single family and all middle housing types, uh, certainly attached single family, but also duplexes, triplexes, fourplexes, um, cottage cluster. Um, based on the densities that we're looking at, all of those housing types would be possible in climate friendly areas. And I think that's an important point because Senate Bill, I think it was Senate Bill 458, which passed a year or two ago, allows for land divisions uh, for middle housing types. And what that means, um, what that means is that we have home ownership opportunities for people, which is another, uh, another criticism that we've heard of the rules. So, um, Anyway, that's just some perspective. I want to kind of reply to some of the um, some of the comments that we've heard. Uh, we've really tried to create a lot of opportunities with these rules and a lot of flexibility. Are there any questions on these provisions? Barbara Boyer has a question. Thank you, Barbara. Go ahead, please. Thanks. So. 
You talked about the minimum density standard would not be required if they had mixed housing, commercial, residential. Is that correct? Did I hear that right? Uh, Kevin, you're on, on mute. I am muted. Yes, that is correct. I'm sorry, <laughs> Commissioner Boyer. Okay. So in, in, in knowing that, is there... Um, a minimum number of units or square footage with commercial space um, in this provision? Right. So what we do have in the rules is a requirement for a minimum floor area ratio of 2.0. And effectively, what that means is that the development that occurs on the property needs to have the square footage that is twice equal to twice the land area, the site area. And that can be accomplished, you know, with a two-story two building that occupies the entire site, or it could be accomplished with, say, a four-story building that occupies half of the site. Um, it just gets at a level of intensity. It doesn't specify the mix of uses that would occur within that development. Okay, and that was the 2.0 FAR. That was a term I was not um, familiar with as of right now. I apologize. Now. Yeah. No, that's okay. Thank you. That's very helpful. Good. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Lelak. Thank you, uh, Kevin, and, and I really appreciate your your discussion. And it, and it sounds like, and and maybe this isn't the forum. Maybe I should wait till the hearing to just ask the question. But it sounds like, and I don't have my package yet, so I'm just I've been trying to just rip around online with the various links to see the the rules and different configurations. Um, it sounds like the rules respond to sightlines comments at the public hearing about the infill and the redevelopment you just mentioned that with the historic preservation example um and I, I, so so i'm assuming that the rule that you that this approach responds to that scenario that's kind of question one does that sound right where they were talking about you have a building and i know they had a, a couple sightline had a couple of really good examples of what that might look like in terms of redevelopment uh the tenant improvements are those things. So it sounds like the rules have responded to sightlines questions and issues. I'll, that's my first question. I've got a couple. All right. Thank you for that that question, Commissioner Lelak. I will say we have come part way. We've certainly been engaged with staff from sightline. Um, and yeah, this is an area where a, adaptive reuse, I think, really makes a lot of sense. And we, we we see a way forward there. I will say that in our engagement with local governments that have administered minimum density requirements, you know, what what I've learned and actually observed is that to allow sometimes when you allow an incremental density, um, it really can inhibit redevelopment. Um, for a long period of time. For example, even something as small as an accessory dwelling unit, adding that to a site mm -hmm. can really make the difference in terms of whether redevelopment pencils or not, or, or makes financial sense or not. Um, and for that reason, we've kind of fall, stopped short of, of going to some kind of incremental uh, measure um, because again, we're, it's, it's trying to balance a lot of uh, competing, competing things here. Thank you. Uh, my second question um, is uh, our, uh, I think it's Jeremy Rogers, our realtors representative at the last RAC meeting just talked about the scenarios in which a local government may be in a, in a position to deny a project because it doesn't meet the minimum density standards in an area, even if it's an increased density. And I think, do I understand that the um, alternative path approach may address the issue that was raised at that rack meeting, can you just um, kind of walk me through that that scenario a little bit? That would be helpful. Yeah. Yes, yes, and thank you, Commissioner Lelak. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So again, that outcome-oriented approach is not required to adopt minimum density standards or height allowances as set in in the prescriptive path. So in in a, in a sense, the local government is allowed to choose their own adventure. To to you know, hey, here's our development code. Here's how it's working. If it's something that they've had in place, that's great because then they can point to development that's happened. And if it is achieving what we want to see, um, it's good to go. And there's no need to apply a minimum residential density in that instance. 
Thank you. And if I could just have one, one last question, and that is that uh, throughout a lot of meetings, um, you've used that really great picture about what a climate friendly area looks like, the McMinnville downtown. And I, we've seen it behind the, the Springfield mayor when he's presented as well. A couple stories, ground floor. So I think about that as being the classic mixed use building that we would see um, Springfield, McMinnville, et cetera. And so as I understand it, in a mixed use uh, development, those would now clearly be allowed uh, be, without meeting the minimum density standard because they would have the ground floor office, retail, what, service, whatever it may be, and then the upper floor residential standards. Do I, am I understanding that correctly? You are, you are yes, Commissioner Lelak. Um, yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, in the case of that specific development, no minimum density would apply. And in fact, we've gone a little bit past that to say if a local government wishes to require ground floor, retail, commercial, office, whatever, they're de facto requiring a mixed use building that will exempt them from minimum densities. Thank you, all very helpful, Kevin, thank you. Other commissioners have questions for Kevin? I don't see any hands up. Um, I really appreciate, I always appreciate the whole staff um, and in particular on the housing piece, Kevin, you do a really nice job of explaining this. Um, I think there I, there still remains a lot of misinformation and perhaps out there, I believe, about what these rules do and don't do. Um, and perhaps it comes from confusion and I've had my own <laughs> points of confusion. I, it, things get clarified the more you talk about these things. And so I'm just thinking ahead to the actual hearing next week. Um, the idea of pictorials, you know, site plans. I mean, it's more than just words. Some of us are visual learners. Some of us, you know, can read language and uh, totally comprehend it. I like pictures. So I really want to get at some of these issues that have been raised recently, but throughout the process. And something that we're really concerned about is what is the, the cumulative effect of House Bill 2001, House Bill 2003, our rule, how, our draft rule, how does that affect housing supply, affordability, home ownership? Those kind of the critical questions I've read from some of the materials we've received throughout the process, and it's, so it's not new, um, but I want to really understand that, especially in terms of some of the things you're describing today, which is flexibility on the ground because one area might have a different housing need than another. There's different displacement strategies or anti-displacement strategies, excuse me, to put in place. But there's also different ways to um, uh, address density, um, livability, and those kinds of things within the CFAs. So that's a tall order. I said a lot, but just a few more pictures, perhaps, um, diagrams, whatever you come up with. And, and you know, it seems to me, and the, when we were doing the housing 2001 rulemaking, um, we had a, hit this sort of same place. We had a lot of really great words and we were kind of getting it. But then at the final meeting or the meeting before the final meeting, you had graphics and pictures and you go, oh, well, that's what you mean. We get it now. So if you could help us along those lines, um, I, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, Chair. We'll do our best. So we're at the end of sort of the formal presentation from staff. And so I was kind of jotting down what I just said, some things that we might want to see at the hearing to help us or the and or the audience understand uh, what the draft rule says and does or would do on the ground. So perhaps this is a place where I could open it up to other commission members to request um, some things that you think might be useful from staff um, in a week and a half. Chairman McCarthy, did you see Commissioner Lelak's hand is up? I'm not sure if that is. Thank you. I, your, your head is cut off on my screen, so thank you. I do not see your hand up, but go ahead. <laughs> oh, well, thank you. If we were just beginning the process of, of, yeah, of big picture discussing in the next 10 days, that, I was just going to jump in on that question. Given that we, uh, there are a, a lot of changes in the revised rules, um, and I'll just say, staff, thank you. Clearly, your the, the package is continuing to evolve. My question is, do you see the, an opportunity for another a listening session or Q&A session for local governments or for anybody from any side? I shouldn't just say local governments, but just from anybody, just because there may be questions that, gosh, so what does this mean? You know, this is new language that some or new approach. I don't know. I just... Um, 
rather than having everybody ask all of those questions at the hearing on the 19th, is there an opportunity for another Q&A session just with interested parties? I'm just curious. And I know the schedule's compressed and I know you're all working um, long hours on, and, and intensely on this effort. I was just curious. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair uh, MacArthur, Commissioner Lelak. We hadn't scheduled one for uh, between now and the next commission meeting. Um, we, I think, had con certainly considered to continue to hold them even after the rules were adopted because we're going to be moving into implementation phase. But um, that's something that staff can look into for sure. Other commissioner, would like any follow up or um, other commissioners? I don't see any hands up. Jim Rue, do you, do you have anything you'd like to add or say at this point? I do not. Thank you. Thank you. And then uh, uh, Deputy Director Green. No, thanks. I think, you know, this is just such an important discussion. And I appreciate Commissioner Lelak asking on behalf of the cities, you know, for a for a for a Q and A session. And it it looks like Bill said, you know, they <laughs> could um, look for time on the um, schedule. It'd be open to all. Um, so it'd just be for all local governments. Um, I think we've asked the RAC to put in their work for sure, but I think Commissioner Lelak was simply asking for all potentially regulated communities to have an opportunity to come ask questions about how things have changed, et cetera, now that the Commission packet was posted last Thursday, so probably I would say either sometime later this week or early next week. But but definitely the sooner the better. But need to also give people some time to read the rules as well. Yeah, thank right. you. Right. Yeah, that. Yeah, that's the that's the issues, and I think that's a good idea. Um, uh, I did find, as I said earlier, that the matrix is extremely helpful because it takes the draft that was presented to us in March and then takes us through the changes. Really, I think it's a pretty nice primer to where we would go in the actual rulemaking or the draft rule to figure out what's going on. So it helped me, perhaps it would help others as well to reflect on that. Um, I don't, as quite, as staff, do you have questions for us? Not to deliberate, but do you have any other kind of things you want to relate to us? I know we can't. Um, uh, have Chair, a discussion. Commissioner, Commissioner Sandoval has a hand up. Thank you, Commissioner Sandoval. Sorry, I didn't see you. Okay, thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'm wondering if there could be a, a space to uh, talk about some of the resources that will be available to cities. Um, you know, when we when they start to implement these rules. That's a great question. There's a, a section in the staff report on that, but I think I agree that we should highlight that at um, the hearing next week. That's critically important. This is a, a big lift for local jurisdictions and all the partners that will be involved in those conversations. Um, and we've been working really hard to make sure that we have resources and a timeline that works. Both those things have to match up. Resources have to be available for deadlines and for work that the local jurisdictions have done. So staff has done what they can on that. And we have some policy option, option packages we're going to pursue. But I think that that conversation should um, happen at um, our hearing next week. Thank you for raising that. Uh, I don't want to forget Director Bateman. I know you're new to this, but and you're probably drinking from a fire hose as we speak. But if you have any um, uh, thoughts or, or comments you'd like to make at this point. Thank you, Madam Chair. I've obviously been watching this for a long time and um, just struck by how much work and energy and investment has gone into this. I'm very pleased with the process. Um, and I, I think it was already pointed out that many of the questions that folks have been raising um, have been answered in our materials, which are extremely thorough. So I, I do want to give folks a chance to read through all of that and um, internalize it and, you know, maybe not hold, hold too many um, hearings before they get a chance or uh, events before they get a chance to, to read through and um, really thoughtfully consider everything that's in there. I think many of the, the questions are answered. Thank you, Director. So hearing or not hearing, not, not seeing uh, any other hands and not hearing anyone uh, offer anything in the way of a question or something else you'd like staff to reflect on, um, 
there'll be it'll be a more robust conversation. I think you go into more detail on some of those topic areas and um, and, and the rest of the staff report pieces. Um, I think at some point too, if you could just reflect at the at the meeting next week, um, it's it's written in the staff report, but a, a lot of work um, was done to um, to correct in, like internal inconsistencies in the draft rules. So a lot of work was done on that, and I think that hopefully has helped with folks to understand the full intent of the rule or the draft rule, because with all those different kinds of little things that didn't quite match, um, that's really tough. But I know staff is working, has worked on that, is still working on that. So um, hopefully that goes a long way to help people understand what the rule says and does, draft rule says and does. I th there's no reason to belabor the meeting then if folks are done. I know staff is busy um, and they would like the time as well as commissioners and others. So um, thanks for tuning in today. Thanks to staff. I, I think it's a really good staff report and related material. So I appreciate um, the work that went into that short time frame too. I think we can adjourn for today. Thanks Thank everyone. Thank you, Madam Bye -bye. Chair. Bye. Thanks, staff. Thank you.